but I just ask God, God, am I stewarding the legacy well? I, I, I want the legacy that I live to be the legacy that I leave. And, and you know what? I, I, want, I, want my, I want my ceiling to be the next generation's floor. Oh, that's all about Camp 274. Oof. Awesome, awesome. Hey, good to see all of you. Where, where, where y'all been? Where y'all been? <laughs> oh, I know you've been here. Man, you had some good services while we were gone. You sure did. Man, Steve, dear Lord, wow. Tore it up. Man, I, I don't know. When I hear that guy speak, I just feel good about me. <laughs> you, you may not feel good about me, but I feel better about me when I hear him speak. What a, what a great word. What a great word. And then Zach, you know, who, who is that kid? Awesome stuff. Wow. We were, we were already home. You know, we'd been down in Florida, which some of you knew that. But uh, we, we'd gotten home like... Oh, really, early in the morning on uh, Sunday morning, late night, Sunday morning, whatever. And uh, we, we just still took another vacation day. <laughs> and and Joy, Joy watched it live. I watched it a little bit later. And uh, man, oh man, I didn't know you could be anointed with one slide. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you had to have more slides than that to, to have the anointing on your life. <laughs> His presence. But what a, what a powerful word. What a, what a powerful word. Amen. So, so let, me ask, let me give you a test. What's the most important thing? His presence. His presence is the most important thing. And uh, boy, I, I really appreciated that word. Amen? amen. Come on, amen. 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 Let's stand together. Give you one more chance to stand. I know you were standing for a while, but that's okay. This is the uh, first church of calisthenics. You get to. <laughs> that's, that's all right, isn't it? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Come on, let's, let's just spend a moment again. Just spend a moment. Lord God, we thank you. God, you are in this place. We, we honor you, God. We honor you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we honor you. We need you in this place. Holy Spirit, we need you in this place. We need you to come and, and show us and lead us and guide us and speak to us. Lord, we hear your voice and a stranger's voice we will not follow. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for the anointing on your word. I thank you for your anointing in this moment. We make space for you. And we ask you to move in our midst. Lord, I, I, I thank you that you know the need of the individual heart. You know the need of the individual life, and I thank you. I thank you. You take the words that are spoken today, and you minister according to those needs. Yes. That's how supernatural you are. Father, I thank you for healing in this house. I thank you that grace is a healing place. I, I thank you that grace is a cancer-free zone. Yes. I thank you, Father God, that this is a house of miracles. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Yes it is. And we are grateful. We are grateful. No weapon formed against us will prosper. You never told us that weapons wouldn't form. You never said they wouldn't form. You just said they wouldn't prosper. So Father, we hang on to that word. We thank you, Father God, on the other side of every weapon is victory. Yes. 
And you see those weapons. You see that. But Lord God, you tell us to set our sight a little bit higher. Look a little bit higher. Look a little bit further. Because there's more to the story. There's more to the story. There's victory on the other side. So Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the victory. <laughs> thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, we give you thanks and praise. And we honor you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and be seated. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. We, and we did, thank you. And we did have a great vacation. It was wonderful to get away. It's always wonderful to come back. And I, I can actually say that. It was good to come home. I, I used to regret when vacations were over, uh, but I don't know. We're in a new day. I just sense a new day. I, I, I sense a new time. It doesn't mean we don't get tired. It, it, you know, everybody gets tired, and everybody, you know, we go through stuff. But, it, but I'll tell you what. I'm so excited about what God is doing in this house. Yes. Yes. I, I, love, I love the fact that, you know, we, we can leave, and I mean, the word is rich through everybody that stands in this place. Yeah. It is so deep and encouraging. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you rejoice in that? Yeah. Do you recognize? Yeah. Come on, do you recognize with this pastor what God has brought to this church? Yeah. Do you recognize that? I mean, it is, it is astonishing what God is doing in this place. Yeah. And, I, I, and I hope you get it. I hope you see that. Let me tell you a little bit about my week, and I, I don't want to spend much time on this, but obviously we got home from vacation. Wednesday was a pretty full day. I taught here Wednesday night, School of the Word, and had a great time, and, and Thursday was just a wall-to-wall -wall day of meetings. Started with getting my teeth cleaned at 7 a.m. I'll tell you what, when you get drive 40 minutes to have your teeth cleaned at 7 a.m., that's an early day. And then I had a wonderful board meeting that night, and it really was. I've got just an amazing board. I'm so grateful for the people that are here to help to lead and guide this church. Uh, but it was a long day. Uh, Thursday, though, you know, I, I, I was trying to, trying to finish up some business, some things I had to pay some attention to. And uh, my secretary, Jill Witt, she's texting me. And, and I see, laying there on, on my desk, I see the text, and she says something about a, you know, a Wednesday uh, wedding rehearsal, and she knows I don't do those. And I, I'm like, I don't have time to even respond to that. I got to get this done. And a few minutes later, I came out of my office, and she goes, did you read my text? I said, yeah, but I've got to finish what I'm doing. I, I, I can't think about anything else right now. She goes, yeah, but here's the thing, the text if you read it, what it says is, you had a wedding rehearsal last night that you didn't show up for. I just went, I mean, I, I'm a, I was just sick to my stomach. I couldn't believe it. Because all of a sudden I remembered the couple that I was doing a wedding for on Saturday, which was yesterday. And the rehearsal, which is weird so many days in advance, but it was at a golf course and they had other things going on. So I totally missed a wedding rehearsal. I mean, I'm in my 41st year doing this. I've never done that. Never, never missed anything like that. So, you know, it just kind of sets your day in a really bad place, right? And I'm just sending messages to that couple and, and you know, just, oh, man, where do I grovel? You know, where, where do I do penance? I'll beat my back. Whatever I got to do, I, I feel terrible. And uh, they were so gracious. They, were, they truly were just so gracious. And uh, then we did the wedding yesterday, and it was the most chaotic wedding I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and it wasn't because of the lack of a rehearsal. It was actually because there were a lot of things added last minute. It didn't start till like 40, 45 minutes late. It was just, it was crazy. It was outdoors, and it was hot. And I mean, the guys all had black suits on, and oh, my <laughs> Lord, it was so hot. But anyway, that's a whole other story. So the whole day was just kind of chaotic, and, and on Friday, I'm prepping for the message, and, and I'm, I'm working through some things, and Saturday, before I went to the wedding, I'm prepping, and I got home, and I'm working on my message, and, and uh, I'm not real settled, but sometimes that's because your flesh gets in the way. 
you know, I, I'm not real settled in what I'm going to bring, and, and I, I can't really figure out why, but so I'm here as I'm, I'm always here Saturday at some point praying and just seeking God, and I'd finished my message. It was all in the slides. I'd sent it to the people that needed them. I'd printed my copy, and I just thought, I just need to pray. So I'm praying, and, and what I did not realize until after the 9 a.m. service, uh, there's a husband and wife, Tim and Dawn. Dawn came up to me, and she goes, hey, listen, I just got to tell you, uh, my husband and I both have an alarm set that uh, every Saturday at a certain time, an alarm goes off, and we stop whatever we're doing, wherever we are. If we're together, great. If we're not together, we stop and we pray for you uh, for the services. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, that, that's very cool. And she said, yesterday I prayed something very different. I've never prayed this before, but all of a sudden I was just overwhelmed. And it was at about, I don't know, about 6.30, 7 o'clock. She was just overwhelmed with the desire to pray for me that, Lord, if the message he has is not the message he's supposed to bring, please show him and help him to know what he's supposed to preach on. <laughs> so it's all Dawn's fault. <laughs> so, so I'm in the lobby. I, I'm praying and just literally enjoying the presence of God. And I don't know if you've all, ever, ever walked up to the timelines. They're still there from our 40th celebration. But you ought to go look at the pictures. They're, they're, very, they're actually quite humbling. <laughs> don't ever ask me to grow that mustache back. It, don't, it won't happen. <laughs> My wife will tell you it will not happen. She hates that mustache. I don't like it either. But anyway, uh, I, I'm out there praying, and I walked up to the, at, at that end and this end. If you've seen it, there's a picture of my grandfather who started seven churches, uh, Royal Oak, Berkeley, Clawson, throughout that area. And the first six churches he built, he was, he was ordained by the Christian Missionary Alliance, and they kept taking his churches away. They kept giving him the boot. And, and it was because he was very radical. Now, he was Christian Missionary Alliance, and they believed in healing, but not the way he believed in healing. He was just radical about healing, and he just said, listen, it's always God's will to heal everybody every time. And the miracles that happened were just unbelievable, astonishing. So they would take his church's way. He also was a faith preacher. He also believed in prosperity. He, he just believed in all these things. And, and then he built his seventh church. There's a picture up on that timeline. Uh, by the seventh church, he, he wised up and he put in the bylaws that they could not take his church away. <laughs> it, it only took seven churches to, to figure that one out. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing, and uh, there's nothing spooky about this. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be weird or... Or like I heard a voice from my grandfather. You know, trust me, don't talk to dead people, okay? Just don't do that. It's, it's actually prohibited in, in Scripture. Uh, just ask Samuel when you see him, okay? <laughs> or not Samuel, ask Saul, King Saul. Ask King Saul when you see him. Samuel too. <laughs> Samuel wasn't real happy about that. Uh, but, but I went over to that, uh, to the timeline over there, and I just... I was just overwhelmed with the sense that I needed to, I, I laid my hands on the picture of the church and my grandfather, and I just prayed a prayer, and I just said, God, and I, I'll tell you, I got emotional. And, and I prayed, I said, God, am, am I stewarding the legacy Am, am I stewarding the legacy well? Because, because listen, the people that have gone before you, if, if they were godly and they're moving in a godly direction, I, hopefully you know something about that because that's a part of your legacy. The legacy you leave would be the legacy you've lived. Not, not, not the life you should have lived, but the one you did live. Uh, for good or for bad. And, and, and my grandfather wasn't a perfect person. Uh, not at all. Uh, in fact, he was, he was pretty flamboyant in some ways. Uh, whatever, it's just some personality there. 
But I just ask God, God, am I stewarding the legacy well? I, I, I want the legacy that I live to be the legacy that I leave. And, and you know what? I, I, want, I, want my, I want my ceiling to be the next generation's floor. Does that make sense? So it was in that instant that I knew, and then all of a sudden, man, now I got, now I got scared because my sermon's done. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he spoke to me, and he said, that's good, that's good. Now, do you want to preach the message you have or the one that I want you to preach? Come on, <laughs> that's, that's kind of a boom, little kick in the backside, don't you think? And, and so I, I just said, well, of course. I mean, if I'm headed in the wrong direction. And no doubt it's why I felt such, you know, disease comes from the word dis-ease. Yes. And that's why I was feeling the dis-ease in what I had, even though it was a good message. <laughs> it was a good message. It just wasn't the right message. Is that Okay. So a few weeks ago, I started a series. I didn't intend it to be a series, but I called that week, It's Fundamental. And, uh, and you know what? Everything that, everything that I thought about preaching, it's, it's based on just some of the fundamentals. I was going to preach on generosity and, and, and I had some really, really good points, but it just, it just wasn't alive in me. Well, now I know why. Now I know why. So you don't mind if I bring you his message. Right? And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. The way I had written my message, I had, I had 13, I think 13 slides. And now the one that I don't know that I'm supposed to preach or don't really know how I'm going to preach it, I got it down to three. One of these days I'm going to show up with none and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat them. No, I have Oh, no. so, so you say, well, what did you preach at 9 o'clock? I'm really not even sure. <laughs> what are you going to preach right now? I really don't know. Okay. So is that okay? Yes. Is that all right? Yes. So over the last few weeks, and of course you know the message last week, his presence. Nothing more important than his presence. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Nothing more important. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Uh, but there are three words that Zach has spoken about or even just kind of dropped them. Of course, his presence, he talked more about it. Uh, but a few weeks ago, he mentioned two words, and, and those are the words fire and glory. Fire and glory. And, and boy, ever since then, there's something on the inside of me that has wanted to know more about three things, and that is, I want to know more about his fire, I want to know more about his glory, and I want to know more about his presence. Amen. <clears throat> and, and the thing is, is when you see fire, you may think uh, every time you see fire, see, fire is very destructive, it, it is. It's, I mean, you know that. It, it can be very de destructive. But it's also uh, very useful. I mean, it keeps you warm, right? So the very thing that can be very destructive can also be very useful. It, it just depends which one you tap into. There, there is a fire, and we see it in Matthew chapter 3. You can write it down, look it up later. We see a fire. The, uh, John the Baptist, he says, uh, I baptize you uh, with, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who is going to baptize you with fire. There's one coming after me that's going to baptize you with fire. And then he talks about the purpose of that fire. The purpose of that fire is to burn away the chaff in our lives. To burn away the chaff. And what is the chaff? The chaff is the useless stuff. Yes. 
Because if you know, if you know anything about farming or, or threshing wheat or grains, you understand back in the day, they would actually take like a, a, a you know, a big thing. They, they'd throw the grain in the air and the wind would blow the garbage, the chaff, the useless stuff, it would blow it away. And eventually all they would have left is the useful stuff. The useless stuff was, was blown away. And he says, there's somebody coming and he's going to baptize you with fire. And the purpose of that fire is very useful. It is also very destructive. It'll burn away the chaff. Uh, but here's the thing. I think when the church hangs on to the chaff, when the church hangs on to the chaff, which let me tell you, the church seems to be infatuated with chaff. And we have got to separate the good from the bad. We have got to allow the, the, the spirit of God, we have got to allow that chaff to be burned out of our lives. There, there's something he's wanting to do. He, he wants to bring his presence, but he will, he will not honor us with his presence with the existence of chaff that we know about, but still give more honor to than we do to his presence. I, I'm looking at the world today and it, it just seems like year after year, I say it and I say, the world's going crazy. How many of you know the world is crazier this week than it was even last week? I can't even believe the things I see. If those of you were, you know, so blessed to watch the opening ceremonies of the Olympics and, and you saw the blasphemy, you saw the absolute mockery of Christianity. I'm not going to go real deep into this, but it was just a mockery of Christianity. I mean, so much of it was filled with a parade of, of those that were uh, transvestites and transgenders and cross-dressers and homosexuality. I mean, it was on display in living color, the craziest stuff you ever saw in your life. And it ends with the Last Supper scene. It is, it is a replica of... Was it Michelangelo? Oh, Da Vinci. Da Vinci's painting of, of the Last Supper. And, and it was made up of all the transgender and all the cross-dressers and homosexuals and even a child. And Jesus was, and I don't, I'm not saying this to be offensive, I'm just saying it was this severely obese transgender woman playing the part of Jesus. An absolute mockery. Let me tell you something. If you think, uh, they're, they're not going to do that to Islam. They're not doing that to Buddhism. They're doing it to the only religion on the planet that makes a change in people's lives, and that's because of Jesus Christ. Nobody mocks Buddha. Nobody mocks Muhammad. Nobody mocks Allah. Why? Because they're all dead. They're not even real. They're not even real. I mean, Muhammad was real. I, I get it. Muhammad was real. I, I get that. I get that. Uh, but but they're, they're, they're dead. If they were alive, they're dead. And they never rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He is, he is the only one. He is the only threat to the enemy's kingdom. But here's the thing. We have Christians in the church that are applauding the mockery of Christianity. And they say, we got to give them a voice. We're giving the devil a voice. And there are people in the body of Christ that are approving of that. And you say, how do you know that? Because I watch social media. I, I see the comments. 
I see people that I know are believers and they're applauding the fact that we could, uh, you know, be honest about uh, the, the, uh, the diversity and applaud the diversity. That's nonsense. That, that's like you being in Sodom and Gomorrah and saying, hey, the fire's starting to fall. This is great. I mean, I, I, I look at the world, and dear Lord, I'm not trying to give an expose on entertainment and all that kind of stuff, but I, I look at the world today. I look at the world of music today. I, I, I mean, what, what are these people? Sam Smith, uh, Kim, Kim Petras, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, uh, for all you Swifties out there, uh, Lil Nas, Billie Eilish, Jay-Z. What do they all have in common? Every single one of those and more have in the last year or so written songs, done videos that glorify Satan. Yes, even Taylor Swift in her, in her uh, uh, concert. There's this whole satanic scene and, and we're like, oh, that's my favorite. I'm a Swiftie <laughs> and, and I'm a believer. I'm sorry. The line has got to be drawn. We say, we say, God, We say, God, I want your presence. God, fill me with your presence. He will not share his presence or his glory with that. He will not. He will not. We say that the world has lost its moral compass. The world has never had a, war, a, a moral compass. Here's, here's why. Because only those that serve God have access to a moral compass. So, so what, do you call, what do you call the world trying to make... And listen, there are moral people in the world. Don't get me wrong. There are people that live very moral lives. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying... Uh, they want to do good things. Uh, but I, uh, but I, I, I state with my statement, they don't really have a moral compass. It's like in the days of Noah. The Bible says, I think in uh, uh, Matthew 24, it says uh, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. That's right. That's right. And if it, if it goes crosswise with the will of God, the plan of God, the word of God, so be it. This is what I've decided. Here's the thing. That's called humanism. Humanism is when humanity tries to come up with a resolution for problems of humanity apart from God. And here's the thing. Humanism has entered into the church. Humanism is alive and well in the church. Because when we begin to come up with our own solutions, we, we begin to come up with our own, that's right, and that's right, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. And we come up with it ourselves. Apart from God, we've allowed humanism to enter into the church. Let me tell you something. We need the glory of God in the church. We need the presence of God in the church. And, and his presence, his presence, his glory, is not going to share space with a humanistic approach to his kingdom, uh, to his will, his way. Come on, amen. Uh, go over to, go over to uh, Matthew chapter 21. Uh, let, me, let me read this. Uh, let me read something to you. You, you got to understand that, how, how many love the promises of God? Yeah, I, I mentioned a few of them already. Grace is a healing place. Amen. You say, well, healing, really? For everybody all the time? Yes, every time. Every time, everybody. You say, well, I know people didn't get healed. So do I. I know people didn't get saved. Doesn't change the word on salvation. <laughs> yeah, you understand? <clears throat> I understand? I understand there are people that never prosper. That doesn't change the word on prosperity. Right. I, I understand people that don't walk in love. That doesn't change the, the word on walking in love. Yeah. The word is the word. The word is always true. And if it says it, I believe it. Come on, amen. He sent his word and he healed them. 
uh, he, he said in Psalm 103, verse 1 through 3, that we can bless the Lord, O oh my soul, forget not his benefits. He forgives our iniquities. He heals our disease. By his stripes we are healed. Come on, on and on and on and on and on. His word is his will. Yes. Amen. Amen? Amen? So the promises of God, somebody counted them up once. Somebody said there are like 3,300 different promises of God in Scripture. I don't know if that's true. There's probably some duplicates. Whatever. There are a lot. But here's the deal. Every promise of God has a path. Did you hear what I said? Every promise of God has a path. Every promise of God... Uh, uh, let me give you a for instance. Uh, in, in Mark's Gospel, it says... Uh, it, Mark 6.18 or three, something. It's in the book of Mark. Read the book of Mark. You'll find this. It's, <laughs> it says... Given, it shall be given unto you. Shall be given unto you. Oh, huh, I can't wait for the given unto me, given unto me, given unto me. Yeah, but it says, given, it shall be given unto you. Given, it shall be given. There's always a path. There's a path to prosperity. There's a path to prosperity. Uh, I don't know if you've ever studied uh, the miracles of God and the things God did. There is, there is almost... There are very few instances of something from nothing miracles from God. He uses what's in our hand. He uses, uh, he tells us, do this and watch this happen. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Come on, amen. With every promise, there's always a path. Let me, let me show you something that, that I believe is so important. How many want his presence? Amen. How, how, many, how many of you want his fire? Yes. How, how many want to see his glory? Yes. Do you really? Yes. Do, you, do you realize there's a path? There's a path? And I don't know what your path is. I mean, it's got to be according to the word. I get it. But there are things in my life... There are things in my life that may not be in your life, and I've got to check out my own life. Come on. I mean, you know, the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, hey, I've done everything. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, hey, listen, sell everything you've got, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. Isn't that what he said? And he walked away very sad because he had a lot of riches. Don't use that as an anti-prosperity verse. That was the one thing for that guy. That was the one thing for that guy. What's your one thing? You, you got, I got probably 18 of them, all right? And so do you. You probably got more. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but we all have a path. I, I, there are promises I want to possess, but there's a path to the promise. Amen? So, so I want the fire. I want the glory. I want the presence. But there, there's going to be a path. There is a price to pay there is a price to pay. I believe that his presence, I believe that his presence is a, it, 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 it's, how, it's, how, it's like a, a stamp of approval on where his church is at that moment. His presence will not, he won't share his presence with a church filled with sin. Okay, let's read this. Where did I tell you to turn? You're right. That's good. And I've, I've ministered on this over the years. I, I want to share it with you real quick. In verse 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus uh, went into the temple of God and he cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables and the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David. They were very displeased. And he said to them, don't you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, have you not read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings he has perfected or ordained praise? And that's out of, out of Psalm chapter 8. 
So, so here's the thing. Here's the vision that I got out of this many years ago, that there are four houses that God wants to build in the church and in our lives. And, and can, I, can I fill you in on something? He's not going to build it in the church if it's not built in your life. You bring individually into the corporate gathering. So, so if it's not in you, don't complain when you don't see it in the church. Can I, can I tell you something? Things can be, some of you have, have I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but some of you have experienced the presence of God in this place in a very profound way today. I know I did. Those songs were perfect for me. And, and yeah, the quality was good. The music was good. The vocals were good. That's all great. But there was something about my position in him today and my ability to enter in. The presence of God just came into my life. At one, at one time, I just envisioned, I didn't have a vision, but I envisioned Jesus standing from his throne and receiving the praise. And man, I'll tell you, I was just overcome, overcome with emotion. Let me get back to, let me get back to this situation. So, so he says he's, oh, I know what I was going to tell you. We can have the presence of God and these two go, it was incredible. And it, well, I can't use you two because I know you two. Huh? I'm kidding. I mean, all of a sudden, it's like you experience the presence of God and you're kind of like, I, it was good service, but I didn't feel nothing. I didn't sense nothing. And then all this, and, and it's like, if you took a poll, there would be people who say, yeah, it was a good service. I'm glad I went to church. Other people are like, I got absolutely rocked by his presence today. And you say, what, is God somebody that just kind of picks and chooses who he, you know, does? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's the preparation of the vessel. It's, it's, it's what's going on in the vessel that makes all the difference. It's, it, it's what's going on in us. So, so here's, here's the thing. I believe he wants to build four houses in our lives and in the life of this church. And, and how many of you know what the first one was that he was building? It, it, it wasn't a house of prayer. That's, that's the second one he mentioned. But the first house he was building was a house of purity. Remember, he came into the temple, and man, what I love what one of the gospels says. He sat down, premeditated, I'm going to mess you up. <laughs> he sat down, it says he sat down, and he formed a whip. He thought this thing through. He says, I'm, I'm ready to take some people out. Uh, this is making me so angry. And I just, I just wonder, how would he feel about the church today? Don't you wonder sometimes? I, I just wonder, you know, what have we brought into the church? And, 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 and so what did he do? He went and he turned over the tables and, and he drove the money changers out of that place. What did he do? He, he, he was declaring, I want a house of purity. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, yeah, but he wants to build a house of prayer. I want to tell you, the house of prayer, what did he do after he declared the house of prayer? Then he healed everybody that was there. So, so you've got the house of purity, and I believe that house of purity makes way for the house of prayer, the house of power, and the house of praise. Yeah. And, and here's, here's the thing. Without the house of purity, we, we've got to, we got to get some things cleaned up in the church. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed it, but man, it's, it's been in Christian headlines over the last several months, I mean, it's like preachers that have been, I mean, some of them have been some of my very favorite. And they're falling. Not they fell. It's what they did in the past is being found out. Listen, make sure your sin finds you out. I'll tell you what, sooner or later, it's going to come out. It, it's going to come out. And, and, I, and I hope it does. There is an exposing that you need not be afraid of. You need to be afraid of the chaff you're holding on to. 
You need to be, a, you need to be concerned about that. So if we want the presence of God, we've got to stop. Listen, people, we've got to stop making. I mean, you know, we're in election season. Isn't it great? <laughs> Isn't it great? It's so great. It's so mixed up. It's so messed up. It really is. It's so messed up. <clears throat> I got to tell you, Christians, have you have better get your head on straight when you go into that voting booth. When the righteous lead us, people rejoice. You say, oh, you know, that man's an adulterer. I could never vote for him. Which adulterer do you want in office? The last election, we had two running for office. The difference is one had repented. The other has never even admitted it. I'm sorry. And, and I look back to almost two years ago. It would be two years this November. Two years ago this November uh, was voted in Michigan, changing the very constitution of Michigan that allows abortion up to the due date. And I'll tell you why. You say, that happened here? Yeah. What did you vote for? Well, I voted for this, and Proposal 3 seemed like a good idea. You ought to be in control of your own health. And that's such a lie about the health of the baby. Yeah, you know, so here's the thing. Proposal 3 got voted in because Christians either stayed home. We're the biggest voting block on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Nothing gets passed if Christians get involved and vote righteously. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Uh, you know, you say, I don't want the pastor talking about politics. Well, listen. <laughs> Some, somebody's got to say something, man. It, yeah. it, this is nuts. This is, this is absolutely crazy. And we just sit back and say, Pastor, just preach, us, preach to us about walking in love. Yeah, we need that. We need that. We need to walk in love. One more thing. Play my Columbo. Hey, hey. One more thing. I don't know if I want to get into this. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. In Acts chapter 5, you'll see a story that it's pretty, tell God I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> he's the only one that calls during church. He is. It's probably important. Uh, there, there's, there's a story in there. And I understand it, it causes a lot of theological questions. I, I know it does. But it's there. It's real. It happened. It's new covenant. It's new covenant. So I, I can't always, I, I can't just sit there and explain it away. I can just tell you what it says. It's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to desire the presence of God and still maintain the unrighteous attitudes and the sin and the the, the, the things that need to be driven out of your temple, it's a very dangerous thing. Ananias and Sapphira found that out. They lied in the presence of the Spirit, and I can't make theological sense out of it because it seems to be very different from some of the things that I actually believe to be true. However, they died. They didn't die because they were sick. They died because they, they were in the powerful presence of God. And they came in and they told a bold-faced lie and boom, they dropped dead. 